Hello everybody and welcome to our weekly Bible study continuing in the Acts of the Apostles. Uh, just a couple of things uh, to say to you. We've had a, a couple of technical challenges in the past week and I just ask you to please bear with us. We had a, a hissing sound uh, throughout uh, one of our recordings and then on Sunday our live streaming uh, we somehow or other got stuck on a, a freeze frame, a, a blank freeze frame. I hope this didn't distract too much from your ability to join in the devotions and the Bible study. Uh, we're working on it. We're not professionals. We're not the BBC. So uh, thanks for your patience as we, as amateurs, continue to work uh, through this. But we hope that these ministries of Sunday worship uh, as well as Bible study are being of benefit and a blessing to you all. Lord, open your word to my heart and my heart to your word that we may grow together in the knowledge of your love. Acts chapter 10. Uh, at the end of Acts chapter 9, we have seen Peter very significantly uh, ministering in uh, Gentile parts of uh, what we call the Middle East, uh, really around southern Lebanon, northern Israel, uh, remember that the modern day borders uh, weren't necessarily in place though the countries would have been known by those names uh, in those days as well so he's in that area and uh, we're going to move into chapter 10 we're just going to look first of all at the first uh, seven or eight verses and then we we'll move on into the, the chapter we'll see how the time goes uh, with this study this week how quickly we move on and the reason I'm doing that is these uh, chapters that Luke has written for us, uh, or the way Luke has been divided into chapters later by the church, uh, are quite long, very detailed and very significant. And because of COVID-19, uh, we have time to, to gently just push our way through a little bit at a time. I'm not quite sure uh, when I started uh, this journey in the Acts of the Apostles but it was months ago uh, and we're at, we're at chapter 10. At Caesarea there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian Regiment. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. One day at about three in the afternoon he had a vision he distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord? he asked. The angel answered, Your prayer and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who was one of his attendants. He told them everything that had happened and sent them to Joppa. Luke gives us a lot of detail. It's the same in his gospel as well. He doesn't uh, adopt the same style as Mark's gospel, uh, which is anxious to keep us skipping along. Uh, he, he, he takes us through in uh, almost forensic detail so that we will know uh, many significant things in each uh, short passage of his story. And so we have this man Cornelius, a Roman centurion. Uh, cent uh, is the Latin word for 100, and even today with the, the dollar and the euro, it's divided into 100 cents a century, 100 years. We tend to think, therefore, that a centurion was uh, a man who was an authority over 100 soldiers. That was notional. And at different times in the history of the Roman Empire uh, and its extraordinarily efficient army, uh, you have uh, the centurion would have, uh, role would have varied somewhere between 35 to 40 soldiers and at other times about 80 soldiers. So really, I suppose, 
uh, uh, about a platoon strength in modern infantry uh, thinking. Somewhere between a platoon and a company sometimes. A centurion had to have served at least 10 years and to uh, be appointed to the role of centurion obviously had to be a very proficient, efficient, professional soldier. Uh, it was a professional army. You spent decades in the Roman army and uh, expertise and experience were very, very important to this appointment. You had to wait for the previous centurion to either retire or to die before you got, uh, or before you were considered uh, for the position of centurion. So this is a very worldly wise, tough man. Uh, and he's there, part of the occupying army. But the Romans never thought of themselves as occupying anything. It was just theirs, as far as they were concerned. A very imperial uh, mindset. He's further down the coast from where uh, Peter is. He's in Caesarea. And he is described in great detail. He's a centurion in what's called the Italian Regiment. And he and all his family were devout and God-fearing. This is something we often uh, miss as we read the New Testament. The God-fearing Gentile. People who worshipped the one true God of Israel. And it's the only reason this uh, term God-fearing will be used in the New Testament. This is a Gentile who worships Almighty God. And despite all that we understand and know about Judaism and the, the Hebrew understanding of their place in the world and our understanding of their place in the world as God's chosen people, there were always those who were admitted more closely uh, to them who were God-fearing Gentiles. Gentiles nonetheless, but they were acknowledged. They were acknowledged in the very design of the, the temple in that there was a court of the Gentiles. The, the temple was not a forbidden place to uh, Gentiles. Gentiles could go in and out and God-fearing Gentiles uh, went there as well. So uh, we must acknowledge uh, who this person was. Now his background uh, would presumably have been typically uh, Roman and his uh, background therefore would have been kind of in, well in modern terms we would refer to as folk religion and pantheism. Pantheism means the worship of many gods and spirits. Uh, and that would have been the background. Uh, Romans had gods of their household, gods of their doorways, gods of the, the pavement, gods of the crossroads, and so on and so forth. <coughs> and uh, these were acknowledged in various ways. Then there was a blending, of course, across into the, the, the Greek world uh, and the Greek gods and so on. So this is a, a man who, out of that uh, very uh, colourful uh, tapestry of spirituality has come to a conclusion that no, uh, these people who live in this part of the world are right, there is but one God and I will worship him. Uh, we have come across God-fearing centurions before, people who are held in high esteem uh, in the ministry of Jesus. Could this be the same person? Might be. Might not. We don't know. Luke doesn't say this. By the way, this is the same man that we encountered uh, in the time of Jesus. They existed. And they existed, interestingly, among the occupying forces. Uh, it was clearly not unheard of because there are two or three of them scattered about in the New Testament. And he has an attendant, another soldier, who is also god friend, But he and his whole family are worshippers of Almighty God. Now, in the Christian context, we have to take pause and acknowledge that are there those out with our doctrinal uh, and uh, spiritual definitions? Are there those beyond the boundaries of what we define as being Christian and Orthodox and on the team, as it were, or part of our our family of spirituality, who also are God-fearers. Well, of course there are. Of course there are. There are people who very devoutly commit themselves to, to God, maybe uh, without the definitions and overlays and templates that we have, but nonetheless are very uh, committed to the worship of the one true God. 
we have to remember, for example, that at the, the Pentecost, it describes not only the anointing of the, uh, the disciples, the apostles at Pentecost, and the explosive birth of what came to be known as the church, we have to acknowledge that uh, beyond that, it says that the Spirit of God went out into all the world. Is God at work in every corner of his creation? Say no, and you're not acknowledging who God is. Are those beyond my definitions of the baptized, the people who can say yes to the Trinity, uh, and all those things, who nonetheless are in fellowship with God? And, and there must be people like that. And I find myself caught in a place of tension. And a place of tension is a good place for us as Christians, it's where we're meant to live, that we have this kind of being stretched across what we understand to be right and what actually is. And how do we acknowledge that? For example, I would be very orthodox about the use of, our, of the creeds and what the Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church means in a particularly orthodox understanding uh, uh, historically and in, up to the present day uh, that we have to be Trinitarian, that we have to acknowledge the divinity of Christ, his birth, his death, his res resurrection, ascension, etc., etc. And all those things are, are very, very important. Do I know people of the Christian faith who know nothing of these definitions? Yes, I do. I know Christians who, to my great puzzlement, don't have sacraments as part of their worship. I don't understand that, but that's the way they are. I hope that Christians look at me and may be puzzled, <laughs> probably are, may be puzzled at the very thought of wearing robes, using liturgies and all those types of things. They're less important things. Uh, and there has to be uh, room for a flexibility around the tension. And I had this discussion with a close friend a few months ago about uh, the need for orthodoxy and the need for a flexible understanding uh, of who is within uh, the family of God. The other thing that we find difficult, and even within Judaism at the time of Jesus, was the idea, and we've seen people like this already in the account of the Acts of the Apostles, people who have been proselytes, people who have converted into Judaism. And that seems to be counterintuitive altogether because... Uh, we understand that unique among all the world religions, Judaism is not only a, a faith-driven uh, uh, spirituality, it is also an ethnic thing uh, that one is uh, descended from Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. That one can trace oneself back to the twelve tribes, as St. Paul does very clearly in the, the letter to the Philippians and elsewhere. He tells us he's of the tribe of Benjamin. Indeed, within Judaism, very wisely, and as we now understand more about DNA, uh, within Judaism, it, it was always considered that you traced your lineage back through your mother. Because a father could be anybody. Uh, a, a mother could be uh, the victim of, of rape through enslavement or, or some other cause. The father may be an unknown quantity in all of this or fathers going back maybe when you consider you know uh, the time spent in Egypt the time spent in Babylon the time spent under the Assyrians uh, the time spent under various rulers uh, down the generations but the, the, the tracing back of your lineage through the mother is very important within Judaism and yet there was this debate that was a very live issue because of course uh, that religious matters, there are always going to be live issues and battles and arguments. There were those who didn't like the idea that you could have a proselyte, uh, somebody who could be admitted into Judaism. For a man to become uh, accepted within those groups of the, of the Jews as a proselyte, he had to be circumcised. And that's going to be a significant matter. And we're moving into these waters of the, the significance uh, of these things for the early Christians who by and large to this stage are predominantly, predominantly uh, of Jewish heritage. Okay, And the, the tide is beginning to turn. We're at that moment of turn now at this place with uh, Peter in Joppa and Cornelius and his vision 
in Caesarea. So it's, it's very, very important. So uh, had uh, Cornelius uh, proselytized, had he, had he become uh, a proselyte? No, he hadn't. He was a God-fearing centurion, a God-fearing Gentile. And God sends his messenger to a Gentile. Is this the first time? It is in the Acts of the Apostles. Uh, we see a heavenly visitation uh, to this man. And this is the first time, I believe, in the Acts of the Apostles. And he has a vision of an angel. And the voice says, Cornelius. Cornelius stares at him in fear. This is not uncommon in an encounter with the angelic and the heavenly. Uh, we have lost all sense of awe and the proper use of that word fear. I don't mean fear that you're going to be whacked around the head. Just overwhelmed and, and, and scared by the enormity of what we're looking into uh, when we come to uh, church. If we really, really believed that we were going to have an encounter with God Almighty an interaction with God Almighty, would we sit around in church talking about the weather and all the rest before we started to say our prayers? Uh, would we go from church uh, so casually? Uh, uh, and so on. And this encounter overwhelms Cornelius. I would say a man like Cornelius was not easy to frighten. I would say it would be a very uh, hard job to frighten. And he is filled with fear. And he said, what is it, Lord? Speaking to the angel of the Lord, he addresses God directly. And your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. And again, because of our extraordinary devotion to the idea of justification by faith and not through works, we often dismiss the idea of works. Notice that the description of Cornelius a few verses before this is that he is a devout, God-fearing man and he gives generously to those in need and prays to God regularly. And uh, in my address for last Sunday, uh, I, we were looking again at love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul and mind and your neighbour as yourself. You cannot be God-fearing without a generosity. You cannot be God-fearing without being good to other people and uh, taking on board your, your duty and your joy uh, you shall love the Lord your God and you shall love your neighbour as yourself. And Cornelius is clearly doing this and his good works have been brought before God and God has taken note and we need to take note of this, that God notices how we conduct ourselves and how we behave before others and uh, it's a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa and go and look send them to find this man called Simon who is also called Peter he's living in the house or he's staying in the home of Simon the Tanner I think that's why he said make sure it's Simon Peter you bring the right Simon back okay and that you will he sends he's to send for this man when the angel had gone God or Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who was one of his attendants he told them everything that was ha that had happened and sent them to Joppa I'm not going to go on into the next bit because that is deeply uh, significant as well it's Peter's great vision uh, at this point just Cornelius's response to God's call is to act on it immediately uh, he hears the direction of God and he acts on it immediately and he sends his deputies to uh, go and get uh, Peter and bring him back. Uh, we really are moving out as we uh, now begin to encounter the real engagement of the gospel and of the uh, embryonic church and the followers of Christ with the Gentile heathen pagan world that is around them. And that ultimately significantly impacts uh, those of us who are uh, European. Because this is the beginning of the work that leads out from uh, Jerusalem 
Judea, Samaria, up into Europe, always remembering that a long time ago in this account, the first springboard of faith is out into Africa. And we talked a lot about that a number of weeks ago with the Ethiopian eunuch. We tend to be uh, so self-absorbed that it's all about us in Europe uh, and the type of Gentiles we are. Forgetting that already, somewhere way down south along the River Nile in the great empire of Ethiopia, there is a man who follows Jesus, who is the Chancellor of the Exchequer in the court of his queen uh, in Ethiopia, who is living the Christian life and sharing it. And there are Christians in Ethiopia to this very day because of that. And all along the, the, the Nile uh, region, uh, there are Christians of that generation from that first church. So, uh, but this is where the account takes us now. And it's not surprising because it's uh, going to be written by a, a Greek Gentile. I don't know if he's ethnically Greek, who cares? But a Greek Gentile called Luke who accompanies a Greek-speaking diaspora Jew called Paul, who was Saul, uh, as they launch out into the wider world. But this is a very, very important corner, and I know that I've said that at every chapter. This is a very, very important corner that we turn uh, in the life and understanding of Peter and the Church of Jesus Christ. So more on Acts chapter 10 uh, next time. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that you have considered us. We give you thanks that you have sent your son Jesus and that you've sent into the world your Holy Spirit. We bless your name for this account that has been handed down to us, recorded by Luke, and all that we learn of your love and your ministry and the ministry of the early church. May we grow through the reading of scripture and the working of your spirit. Bless those at this time who work tirelessly for the healing of the sick. Bless our health service, our doctors and nurses. Bless all who make important decisions across our country and around the world. And bless our research scientists at this time. We commit ourselves into your care and keeping and we commit all those whom we love that we might know and they might know and share a sense of your presence and peace. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen.